already, my friends, we're going to derive the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation. It's a very quick overview of how the derivation is done, and we're going to solve a very common exam problem as well. So this is the exam problem, but we're going to start off with the derivation. If you want a more detailed derivation, I have that in the link below, but let's jump into it. So we'll start off with the definition of Gibbs energy G, which is defined as the enthalpy H minus entropy S times the temperature. Now with this equation, we're going to divide by T and take the derivative with respect to T. And if we do that, then this equation turns into this right here. And now we're going to find another meaning for this derivative. So we're going to start off with the thermodynamic definition of entropy change. dS is greater than or equal to dQ over T. It's greater than for an irreversible process equal to for a reversible process. Uh, but if we assume constant pressure, assume there's pressure vol uh, volume work only, and if we assume that a reversible or irreversible process, regardless of the path, if we assume that the process has the same initial and final state for the reversible and irreversible process, then we can convert this dq into dH using the first law of thermodynamics right here. Now from this equation, we're going to divide by dt. And if we do that, we're left with dS over dt. Again, pressure is constant. And see these two terms? These are like exactly the same. So we're going to substitute into this. Uh, but at the same time, we're going to do the product rule with this term. And I know there's a divided by here, but we can do the product rule assuming this is like H times 1 over T. And I'll explain that shortly once we I kind of show you how it's done. So we're going to do the product rule with this term. And we're going to sub in what this term is, which is this side right here. And if we do that, we're left with this equation right here. See, this is the product rule. So product rule of this is is the derivative of the first function, which is h, derivative of h right here, times the second function left alone, 1 over t is the second function, plus the first function left alone, h, times the derivative of the second function. And the derivative of 1 over t is negative 1 over t squared. And then this, or yeah, and this term right here is this one right here. Now, the reason we did this, even though this looks complicated, it's pretty nice because we can cancel this first the first and third term right here, they're exactly the same. They're equal and opposite in sign. So if they cancel, we're left with this equation right here, which is basically the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation, except we never care about G, Gibbs energy, or H, enthalpy. We care about changes, the change in Gibbs energy and the change in the enthalpy. So what we could do, and I didn't do this just to make things a little more clear to begin with, but rather than have a G here, you can have a delta G equals delta H minus delta S times T. That's the Gibbs energy equation. And we can do this whole process using these deltas right here, knowing that the change in a state function, the change in Gibbs energy is equal to the final minus the initial state. And if we do that, we would get this change in here. So the partial derivative of delta G over T with respect to T holding pressure constant equals negative delta H over T squared. And this, my friends, is the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation in all its form. Uh, it's in all its... <laughs> is the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation in all its glory in differential form, but it's not the most useful form for us generally. Uh, we like to integrate it. So we're going to multiply both sides by dt to separate the variables, we integrate, and if we assume that delta h is constant, so it's not constant, it does change depending on, it does vary on, with temperature, but for a short temperature range, and honestly, for most of your exam problems, delta H will be constant, unless you have an equation for it, so it comes out of the integral. And if you do that, then we're left with this part right here, which is the more useful for us, uh, integrated form of the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation uh, right here. Now, I wanna pause for a minute and explain kind of explain what this represents and what it doesn't represent. Uh, this allows us to calculate the change in Gibbs energy at some temperature, say T2, assuming we know the change in Gibbs energy at a different temperature. So this is a constant temperature process and a constant pressure process as well. So it's not like the temperature is changing during the process, like a chemical reaction. The temperature is not changing, okay? It's a constant temperature. What 
the reason there's two temperatures here is that we have a delta G for one temperature. So the reaction occurs, you have some delta G associated with it. Maybe it's negative something because it's spontaneous. That's, at, that's the delta G at that temperature. Now, if you do that process again, say you do the chemical reaction a second time at a different temperature, there'll be another delta G associated with it. So that's kind of what it represents. Uh, we're assuming delta H is constant, so the change in enthalpy and pressure volume work only. Okay, that was a really, really quick run through of the derivation. Now we'll solve a common exam problem and we'll use the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation to show that this chemical reaction right here, 2CO2 gas plus oxygen gas goes to 2CO2 gas. Uh, you can kind of plug in whatever equation you need. Uh, is spontaneous at 375 Kelvin in one bar and we're given the change in standard enthalpy, which is negative 566 kilojoules per mole and the change in standard Gibbs energy, which is negative 514 kilojoules kilojoules per mole. Okay, so we're going to find out, we want to calculate, uh, well we want to know that this is spontaneous. Uh, so it's spontaneous if delta G is negative at this temperature. So we need to know the value or the sign of delta G at this temperature. Since we need to know delta G at a different temperature and we're given delta G at, at, uh, at some other temperature, we'll use the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation and we'll use the more uh, useful for our purpose integrated form right here. And at this point, we can just plug in the numbers. So now, we so this is our T2. This is the delta. This is the temperature at which we want this delta G for. This is the temperature at what we want this delta G for. This is 298 Kelvin. Notice there's no 298 Kelvin in the question. And this comes up all the time. I purposely did this because your prof might do this. It, this they do this in textbooks. Uh, there's no temperature here, right? And standard state isn't at 298 Kelvin. Standard state can be at any temperature. It's just commonly at 298 Kelvin. So it's so common that if they don't give you a temperature, assume that standard state is at 298 Kelvin, although it can be in any temperature. But if they don't give you one, just assume it's 298. Okay, we plugged in the enthalpy change and the other temperatures, and if we solve for delta G, we get a value of negative 501 kilojoules per mole. It's negative, it was originally negative, it's still negative, which means that the reaction is spontaneous. So the entropy change is greater than zero. Alrighty, hope that was helpful. Hope you got some value from it. Hang in there. I know thermodynamics is not an easy course, but you can do it if you just continue going through it. Most important thing is to do as many problems as you can. Problems, 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 problems. I've solved tons of problems for you that you can go over as, as binge watch if you like. Good luck on your exams, your midterms, and all that stuff, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers. Cheers.